Hello and welcome to another episode on Captain's Dry Dock and in the Dry Dock today we are making Star Trek Voyager slash Deep Space Nine slash Star Trek The Next Generation Movies communication badge and I will show you how I made it. As much as I love the next generation, I personally think the Voyager Deep Space Nine badge design is the best. It's sleek, deceptively simple, and is instantly recognisable as Star Trek. So like my previous next generation com badge build, also on this channel, this had a very similar method of construction, but came with very different challenges to tackle. The first problem I had was a lack of good reference material. Auction sites are a perfect source as they often supply measurements and as well as really good photos from all different angles. But there's a lack of these props that have been sold. And when they do come up, they tend to differ slightly in size, shape and colour due to being made for all different franchises and movies over the last couple of decades. So it's the case of cross-referencing with a cast that I already own. This was from a mould that was taken from one of the actual studio props. You can see, just like the TNG badge, the delta has a gentle curve internally and externally, and the inner silver delta is recessed and the bar is flat. Although the originals were made by hand back in the 90s, I wanted to make mine as if it was the one in the Picard show that was made for 4K TV. So I took a screenshot and increased the light levels on Adobe Photoshop so I could see it more clearly. And we can immediately see how crisp and perfect it is compared to all the other previous Star Trek franchise props. Just like the next generation badge I made, I used Fusion 360, which is free for hobbyists. After finding some decent photos of the badge, I placed it into the program and just simply traced it. I originally found that this was going to be a really easy build to make, however when you look closer at the cast from the original, there's a lot of subtle changes, such as the gradual curve and the internal depth, which had to be worked out with Avernia while cross-referencing with other auction pieces. When modelling in 3D software, I find it helps to imagine how you'd go about making it if it was real life and you're in an old style workshop. The curve is a good example where I made something that behaved like a cookie cutter. This would pass through the delta and make the curve to the exact measurements and profile. The next surprisingly difficult challenge was the internal delta, the recess. Now I'm not a 3D modeler expert and no doubt there are experienced users shouting out now how easy this would be and I'm doing it wrong. But feel free to leave a comment down below because I'd love to learn. Saying that, because I'm learning, it took me time to work it out and I came up with this method. It may not be the best way, but ultimately it worked. So essentially I made another delta so it was separate from the body and I used the same cookie cutter template, just only shallower. Then I merged it with the border that I had already done. So to make it a single object that had a deep recess. See, I think it's a misconception that with 3D printing, you just press a button, job done, that's it. Well, it's not. In fact, it's paved with a road of prototypes, 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 prototypes. All these badges were just prototypes trying to get to that final one that you'll see at the end of this whole episode. Now you have to do trial and error to just try and make sure that what you're designing works well for the particular printer that you have. And actually goes for any machine. If you're doing CNC machining as well, when you design, you've got to design for the manufacturer, not just the fact it looks good on screen. So when it comes to 3D printing, there is a bit of skill in Involved as well when it comes to actually pressing that print button. 3D filament prints can leave a nasty print layer depending on the curve of the surface, such as a delta. But learning from the next generation badge build, I found printing something at a slightly different angle will almost eliminate this issue. Hence, this example was printed upside down and on its side. However, the bar going across the delta also has some curves but on the other surface, which meant this did include print stepping and took a lot of time filling, sanding, filling and sanding, 
when it got to the point that I was practically having to fill and re-sculpt the 3D print, that's when I went back to the drawing board, as there had to be a better way. This time I made the bar separate from the delta so it could be printed on its own in an orientation that suits the shape, which for this was flat on the print bed. However, making this in two pieces meant there was a huge room for error and a faff trying to make sure they were positioned correctly on a delta and perfectly aligned across it. Because if it, the alignment was out just by a few millimetres, you can imagine someone at a Comic Con would come up and point it out. So back to the drawing board once again, where I modified the badge so the bar was one part that intersected the delta and snapped together knowing it was going to be 100% correct. Using grey primer really shows up any imperfections that you can correct before painting, and with a little time and effort can result in a really crisp piece that no one will realise was a PLA 3D filament print. Well, that's unless they've seen this video. As I wanted this to be strong and I wanted to make more of them later on, I needed to make a mould. This was made in a single part mould using silicon bought from eBay using the commonly used Polycraft GP3481FRTV and yes I have placed the link down below if you want to get some yourself. But before I went ahead I needed to set up a casing around the badge. So I used to use plastic card but this is expensive and you know kind of difficult to work with so I learned that I could also use foam board and it is brilliant. I absolutely love this material now. It's cheap, easy to work with and strong and with a hot glue gun it's like real life Minecraft. Using double sided sticky tape the pieces are stuck to the base making sure they're secure as the last thing I wanted is then to start floating in the middle of the silicon as it was setting. To mix the silicon, you have to use a catalyst, which for this brand should be 10% of the weight of the amount of silicon used. So if I use 100 grams of silicon, I would need 10 grams of catalyst as an example. To make sure it's mixed properly, you want the white silicon to turn pink without any streaks while taking care not to treat it like a cake mix and avoid whisking, as this would develop air bubbles which is best avoided if you want a decent cast that needs little finishing work afterwards. If you can afford it, having a degassing chamber that will help suck the air bubbles out is a must, but this method is good for this sort of small scale project. Also on a previous video, someone suggested in the comments to pour from a height as this will allow any trapped air bubbles to escape before filling the casing, which I've now started to do in all my pores. To make sure it reaches all the nooks and crannies, I used a toothpick to encourage the silicon into all the air traps. As this takes a few hours to cure, I have plenty of time. And to eliminate any other air bubbles out of the pink soup, tapping the base and the sides is another way of encouraging them away from the surface of the part being moulded. Now it's set, the casing and badge are removed and is ready to make a cast using a resin called Fast Cast. To cut waste and costs of large mixing cups, I bought a load of plastic shot cups and lollipop sticks which are ideal for small projects like this. Now this stuff sets extremely fast, hence its name, but it does a really good job so long you mixed it quickly and you get it in the mould before it gets thicker. Again, I used toothpicks to get into all the awkward areas that might develop air bubbles. Using a time lapse of 5 minutes, you can see how quickly it turns into a milky colour as it becomes hard. After 10 minutes, it's at this stage you can pretty much pull it out of the mould, but I don't recommend it as it's best to leave it for around about 20 to 30 minutes so it doesn't warp when taken out. So the next question is, is how am I going to attach the badge to the tunic? And that is magnets. So a lot of people don't like using magnets mainly because they're usually quite weak and also when you put them onto your tunic they tend to rotate because there's only one magnet holding it on and it acts like a pivot. But the thing is nowadays you've got some really strong magnets out there. Now those are the ones I'm going to be using. I'm not going to pronounce what they're going to be called because I don't know how to pronounce it but there's a link below on this video. Now some people do use, use pins but the one thing I hate about pins is that 
when you spend a lot of money on a tunic like I have, one of these all the way from America and a Vos tunic from Star Trek Next Generation, you probably spent almost up to 600 bucks on one of these things. And the last thing you want to do is put holes all the way through that cloth and ruin your top later down the line. Now, if you do use pins, that's up to you, but personally, it's not my bag. I'd rather use magnets. Now, to stop the whole rotating of the badge, because there's only like two magnets being used, one on the back plate and one on the badge itself, I'm using four magnets two on the badge and two on the back plate which goes behind the material. This means it keeps it the orientation precise all the time. And also these are so strong that there's no way these things actually come off easily when you're walking around in Comic Con or walking around your house wearing your uniform. Come on, we've all done it. So that's what I'm using for this build. I needed to make location holes for the strong magnets that were going to be used to attach the badge to the wearer. To make sure that they're in exact location to mirror the backplate's magnets, I 3D printed a thin version of the backplate to act as a template so I could mark off the holes. Before making the large holes in the final piece, it's wise to make smaller pilot holes first, as these act as guides for the larger jewel bit to follow later and prevents it slipping across the surface. For the large drill bit, I use a flat head drill bit that's the same size as the magnets. This is actually a drill bit used to drill out spot welds, but is perfect for this task, as it was important that the bottom of the hole was flat rather than pointed. This is so the magnet would fit securely to the base and be in contact with as much of the material area as possible. A good rule of thumb when painting, if you still have the stuff to stick onto the part, is to mask off any areas you want to stick things to, as paint will act as a barrier and you'll only be sticking the object to the paint and not the material, which makes a very weak joint. For this, I use plasticine, which is cheap and easily moulded. Lollipop sticks and masking tape is a great way to secure a small object and allows you to freely move them around when painting. What I forgot to film was that I washed the part in washing up liquid to remove any residual grease from my grubby little hands as I was holding this. And also hitting it with a dust or grey primer and then matte black. As matte black is a great base colour if you're going to be painting the metallic paints later. Speaking of which, the final colours that make this badge is aluminium silver and gold. So I decided to spray the silver first for the inset delta. Next is the gold, but before that I had to mask off the silver. So what is this device I hear you say? And it's not a printer, it is in fact a scoring and cutting machine which is designed to score and cut material. Everything from paper, vinyl to even leather. Now this is ideal for every creator model maker to have on their desk because when you're painting eventually you're going to make your own masks and this will do it for you in seconds. Now this one is a silhouette cameo, it's quite expensive but there are other brands out there such as the Cree Cut and it is superb and after getting yourself a jeweled action airbrush I recommend if you've got the money to get yourself one of these. Now how does it work? Well it comes with a program when you go to the manufacturer's website, download it and you can make your own drawings on that program and feed it into the machine. So you feed it into the machine, you you open up this flap and there's a lovely really intelligent blade right there and you feed in your material of choice which for me is vinyl clear vinyl with low tack to it and then it will just cut it out in seconds like you'll see later on in this video but this machine after using it three three times now i love it mm -hmm. silhouette cameo instead of redrawing the delta mask Fusion 360 allows me to do this from the 3D file, which means it will fit exactly. From that, I exported it as a PDF and then imported that into Adobe Illustrator to clean up. Then I copied and pasted that as a vector into the Silhouette Cutting program. And as I wanted to make more of these, I multiplied this several times. Even though I'm new to this machine, I'm still absolutely amazed how fast and precise it is. For example, cutting one mask by hand used to take me several minutes and would never be 100% accurate, but now only takes seconds and is perfect every single time. The material I use for the masking is a low-tack vinyl, which is more familiar to 2D airbrush artists. 
It's translucent, which helps you see what's being masked. Also, it's impermeable and will not bleed, unlike some regular cheaper paper masking tape. Using tweezers, I carefully placed it over the silver area. And as it's low tack, meaning it's not too sticky, it doesn't matter if it's not in the right position first time as it's really forgiving and will allow you multiple attempts until it's in the correct position. Do you know what's more satisfying than peeling off a protective plastic screen from a brand new iPhone? Peeling the vinyl mask off a newly painted Star Trek Com badge. After hitting the badge with a clear lacquer, I removed the plasticine and used a two part epoxy resin glue. This is a really, really strong glue that sets as a resin and will prevent the strong magnets from popping out when the backplate is removed by the wearer.